All right, so here we're going to go in today. We are actually going to take a look at one aspect, um, not necessarily about leadership, but something to go along with your program. So for those of you who don't know, my name is Steve Atkins. Uh, I do have a doctorate. Don't call me doctor. Just call me Steve. I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not big on titles or anything like that. Um, I'm just a regular old person that just happens to be a teacher, okay? So we are going to uh, spend a lot of time these next four weeks you know, taking a look, in-depth look at, of, at leadership. So there's a few things I want to cover today, but we are going to start off uh, talking about your business plan. Now, part of this program, you guys are going to create a business plan throughout the months, uh, throughout the months to come. So in the next 10 months, you're going to put together a business plan that you'll be able to present as a real, as a real plan. You know, if you were to try to get investors or try to get, uh, you know, money from a bank or something like that to start. But some of you might be saying, well, I really don't want to start a business right out of college, you know, and that's okay because this is knowledge that can help you throughout the rest of your career. You know, let's say you really don't want to start a business, but you go to work for a company. Um, many times within a company, you can act like an entrepreneur and these types of people are called intrapreneurs. And what they do is they, they develop products, they develop services for the company that they're in, maybe even a whole new department. I've done this as well. I actually started a business program at a college I was at. <clears throat> so even though I worked at the college, I very much thought like an entrepreneur starting the, uh, starting the program. And so this is another thing that, that, that can help you if you get to work for a company and you can do something like this. The last reason is, you know, let's say that, uh, you know, you start your career and you get to work for a company and they lay you off. You have the tools uh, and tools in place to be able to start your own business, even do some stuff on, on the uh, side. So this is the type of thing that we want to take a look at. So this month in this class, what I am going to attempt to do is to get you to think about what you want to do with your business plan. And then you're going to do more things on it throughout the months, like in the finance class and the marketing class and things like that. These are all components of your business plan. So my thinking on this is, is to get you to think off, think the right way. Now, like I told you, I've actually got a doctorate in marketing. And, and of course, <laughs> I'm going to think that one of the best things that you can do for your idea is market it well. And there's a lot more to marketing than just advertising because that's the first thing a lot of people think about. So I think the most important thing as far as your business plan idea goes is it's not necessarily the idea, it's the execution of the idea. Of course, the idea is important, but the way you execute it is going to be the most important thing. All right. Like as an example, where to put the business or where to go online or what to do, different things like that. So what we're going to do um, and, and Stefan, that's absolutely right. So that's what we're going to look at today. We're going to kind of look at the execution of your idea. If you do have one, if you don't, that's OK. Maybe this will stir some stuff up into you. OK, to be come up with an idea. So we're going to talk about today that what is called the components of strategic marketing. Now, if you've had a marketing class, this is what we're going to talk about is the four P's, okay? So can anybody tell me why that that you see on your screen right there is the most important thing in your business? It is a pretty simple question, actually. Anybody want to give a shot at that? I pretty much already told you the answer. This that's exactly right. Now, here's where a lot of people, a lot of companies make a mistake. They don't know who their, their customer is or they do not do not know their customer very well. And, if, and it can even go like this. At one time, they did know their customer, but their customer base changed. I will give you an example of this. If we go back to the early 1990s, um, Kodak had about 90 to 95% of the total share of the camera business here in the United States, photography business. Today, Kodak is, is in bankruptcy court. They are selling off assets. Uh, matter of fact, they sold off a billion dollars worth of assets, patents, uh, to Google and Apple. Okay, and that happened about a year ago. So if you take a look at Kodak, they did an excellent job in the early 90s. But what happened? Well, the photography business changed and uh, it went all digital. So somewhere along the line, they asked the CEO of Kodak, you know, why, why did this stop? And he said, well, we wanted to build the perfect digital camera. Well, I got news for you. There is not, and there will never be a perfect digital camera. There's no perfect thing in this world. There can, some things are always being improved on. So they kind of waited for that. It's kind of a stupid reason. 
Uh, also, if you take a look at BlackBerry, BlackBerry is nowhere there what they used to be. They had a huge share of the market. So you can lose focus of your customer. It is vitally, vitally, vitally important that you always know what your customer wants. If these things change, you've got to keep up on this. So let's take a look at this. So we have the customer and we bring this ring around. These are what we call the four P's. Okay, it's actually three P's and a D, but that doesn't sound as good as four P's. So we have product, price, promotion, and place. Okay, so these are things that we pretty much control as a company. Okay, I, I'm not saying that we have complete control of this, but as far as a company is concerned, this is what we have complete control over for the most part. <clears throat> So let's start off with product. Now, under the product, this is actually a category. There's actually three subcategories when it, we're talking about product. We are talking about a good, a service, and even an idea. So let's talk about the differences. Let's start off with good. This is the stuff that we know the most. A good is something that you can hold in your hand. Another way of looking at a good is this is something that we can inventory. We can put on a shelf and wait to be sold later, okay? Service, on the other hand, is something we cannot inventory. You can't store a service ahead of time. You can't store a pizza delivery ahead of time, pull it off a shelf, and just have it be done. A haircut would be a service. You can't inventory in a haircut. It has to be done at that time. Here's some of the biggest differences between a good and a service. Since a good isn't something we can hold in our hand as inventory, we can measure the quality of a good for the most part. You know, we can take, say, a stapler, and we can measure the quality of that. We can make sure this very precise whenever we manufacture it and build it. We can have it like stapled a million times in a row by using a machine. A service, on the other hand, that's a totally different story. It's very hard sometimes to find the quality of a service. And here's why. Let's say that I, you know, we were all in a class, you know, physically together in a room, and I said, okay. I just ate at a brand new Chinese restaurant and let's all go out and eat there. And let's say we all get, uh, you know, we all get sick from it. You know, we get food poisoning. You guys have never tried that, that Chinese restaurant and you will never go back to that Chinese restaurant. I have two friends in the food service business and both of them, and neither one of them know each other because uh, one lives in Wyoming and one lives in Florida. And they've both said on separate occasions, you're only as good as your last meal. You're only as good as your last haircut. You're only as good as, you know, keep on going with the services. So with that, if you think about it, even the college degree that you are getting is a service base. Because what do you get at the end of it? You get a nice little certificate that says, here's your graduate diploma. Congratulations. But what do you have to show for it? Just that little bit of piece of paper and that MB, you know, that, that master's degree at the end of your name. And by the way, you guys won't be the one percenters, but you will be the 8.9 percenters because 8.9 percent, and we're talking about people in the United States here, do have master's degree. Okay. So even this is a service. I'm really only as good as this for first go-to meeting session. If you guys don't like the way that I lecture on this, you probably will not be back to week two and you'll just watch it online. All right. So this is the type of thing that we talk about with a good versus a service. The last one, PhD, uh, you really want me to say that stuff on? <laughs> That's like a quarter of a percent. Okay. <laughs> so I appreciate you asking. I wasn't going to go there. It sounds like I'm bragging and I don't like to, to do that. Matter of fact, when I got my doctorate, Stefan, let me just tell you, I went to the airport and had them page me over the intercom and I've never made me anybody call me a PhD ever since. Never made me anybody call me a doctor. Okay. That was good enough for me just to be paged over the airport. So if you guys have uh, thoughts of going on and getting your, your PhD, you will be in the quarter percenters, I guess, or something like that. So anyways, you guys get the idea how I am as a person on this and, and a teacher. You know, I'm, I'm no better than anybody else. Uh, I just, I did it for me, didn't do it for you. All right, so let's get back to this. So I told you what a good is. I sold, told you what a service is. Under this product is also another category called, called idea. Now, there are companies that are based upon ideas, and there are people, and all they do is work with ideas every day. And let me tell you who these people are. These are politicians. All politicians do every day is try to, is, is try to vote in ideas or come up with ideas or so on and so on. So politicians don't sell a good. They don't sell service. They sell ideas. Okay, Companies, there are some companies out there, mostly they are... Uh, 
they're nonprofit companies, but if you take a look at Mothers Against Drunk Driving, that is an idea that was made into a nonprofit. The United Way is an idea. All this type of stuff right there are another area that falls under this product category. So we're talking about goods, which we can measure the quality. We can talk about service, which we can measure, measure the quality. Harder to do. Idea, man, that's really out in the open there. Okay. So we've got these three categories under product. So any questions on the product before we move on to price? And guys and gals, let me just say this. Anytime you want to jump in, I might not be able to respond to it right away because I like finishing out my thoughts before, we, before I answer your question, but feel free because this is what this is about, okay? Okay, so let's talk about price. Now, price is an, indica is an indicator of quality for most people, okay? Like as an example, <clears throat> we usually kind of consider the higher the price of the product, the better quality it is. The only problem with that is, is if you do spend a lot of money for a product and or a service and it doesn't come back very well, usually we are very, very upset consumers. Like as an example, I was down in Miami a few years ago and I read an article in, in the Miami newspaper about a guy who bought a Lamborghini and how upset he was because he, the, the, the window leaked and he couldn't get his door open half the time. And he said, I spent a quarter of a million dollars for this car. And I sold it because I was in a grocery store parking lot and an old lady had helped me get out of my, my six month old Lamborghini. Now, when you pay a quarter of a million dollars and you can't open the door, you can imagine how upset you would be. If I did that, I would be very livid. Okay. Uh, versus a Honda where you just take it in and get it fixed. You go, okay, well, you know, types of things like that. Not putting down Hondas, but I'm just saying I've had nine Hondas, so I'm not putting them down whatsoever. But a lot of times with price, we have some idea of quality. But let me ask you guys a question. If I said that I built a car that got a thousand miles to the gallon, would you be interested in it? Most of you are going to say yes. But what if I also told you that that car cost a million dollars? That's a totally different story. Okay. So price, even though it's an indicator of quality, we may not be able to give people exactly what they want based upon the price. You just some, simply uh, do away with most of the population when you do this. You know, it's like Richard Branson is going to take these people up into space. I think it is this year, actually, when the first voyage is going. It costs a quarter of a million dollars to go up in that spacecraft. I'm betting that neither us, any of us in here, or many people we know could spend a quarter of a million dollars to go up in space for about two minutes and then come back. Okay. So that's going to price a lot of people out of the market. But that is also part of marketing. What you want to do is the, the price of your product, which can indicate quality, you want to find the people that can, you know, afford these types of things, okay? On the other hand, you can go low end, but also understand that there are going to be people that are not going to want your product or service based upon because it is considered low end. I mean, look at, look at Walmart. Walmart is there for about 90% of the population, but there are a lot of people who will not set foot in Walmart. I won't set foot in Walmart at any time during the night. Okay. It is crazy. And I'd rather go to Target than I would Walmart, but it is based upon low price. Notice I didn't say cheapest. You will never hear a company say we are the cheapest. What they like to say is value. We will talk actually about that in another, another go-to session um, in the coming weeks. But price, we pretty much have control over unless it, you know, what really determines price is a lot of the times the raw materials or how much it costs to offer a service or something like that. So based upon price is a consideration of where and what and why you should put your product and or service out there. You know, if you've got a high end restaurant, as an example, that you're thinking about with a business idea, you know, you would probably want to put this in a downtown area or you'd want to put this around the people that make a lot of money around where they live. You know, you wouldn't necessarily, you know, put a, put a restaurant in, you know, right next to a Burger King, as an example, because Burger King is usually, you know, low end restaurant. Uh, people go there and so on, you know, based upon a certain demographic. That's not saying rich people don't eat uh, uh, hamburgers. They do. But, okay, that's that's good stuff on. But, you know, I'd say a lot of us in here still eat Chinese, not think about the communist thing. <laughs> that doesn't mean they're all communists. Okay. But I know what you're saying with that. But anyways, price is a big consideration. Because remember, for the most part, one thing to remember is it gives an indication of quality. 
and it can even work in the flip side. I had a student class that uh, did wedding photography and, and he had done some on the side and he was starting up a business and he found out that if he did a wedding for $500 and still made money on it, people didn't consider it as good a quality. And then what he decided to do was bump that up to 1500 and he had people coming out of the woodwork because it indication of quality. But also you have to be very, very careful with this because if you do price yourself out of the market, it's very hard to come back down or give up your profits and things like that. Okay. So let's move on and talk about promotion. Now, this is where advertising does come in. All right. Now, there's many, many, many different types of advertising out there. And, and let me just tell you about, um, you know, what you don't want to do because, and, and we'll talk about some of the stuff to do but let me just set this with the story uh let's see i moved down to florida in 1993 my wife and i moved into this apartment building didn't know the area at all and there was a there was a place you know there was a salon about a block away from from our place and my wife went there and she got a uh you know she she got her hair done she goes once you just go there the guy's nice blah 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 so i go there and in the course of about Oh, I don't know, two or three visits there. He found out, and remember, this is 1993. It was kind of the beginning of the internet. He found out that I could do websites. And um, so I kind of did some stuff, I, not not real big stuff, but I did some simple websites for people. And he goes, I tell you what, he goes, if you do a website for my salon, I will give you $500 and cut your hair free for a year. And I said to him, I said, you are wasting your money spending $500 on a website for a salon. Can anybody tell me why that was a waste of money for that salon at that time? Today, maybe a little bit different story, but at that time, and really, I don't even know if it'd still be money well spent. I mean, it would, but you wouldn't want to do a, you know, like a big spectacular one. Why was that a waste of money in 1993 to put a website for a salon? Well, let's say that people did have the internet and, and, and you are absolutely, you are all absolutely right. Now, a lot of people had the internet, okay? But let's say enough of them did. Why was that still a waste of money? If he was going to spend $500 promoting his, his uh, salon, why was it a waste of money versus other things? That's exactly right. And also, let's say you're in France. You're going to tell me you're going to fly to the United States, come to Florida, and get your hair cut there, Okay. That's not the way it's going to work for a salon. What he would have had his money better spent at if he was going to promote his salon was in what area? What might be a better place? No, I mean, in, in promotion-wise. How would you reach the local area? Newspapers is one. That's absolutely right. I don't know about TV, George. This wasn't a very big salon type of thing. I like where you're going with that. Billboards might work. But here's what I suggested to him. Um, I lived in a, in, you know, I lived in Orlando, and I still do. And you know, Lan uh, Orlando, just like other uh, other cities, have got you, you know smaller suburbs. You know, like uh, there's Oviedo and there's Altamont Springs, and there's Longwood. There's these are like smaller towns within the Orlando area. So what I suggested to him is these little small towns have business like. Uh, of not flyers and they're not magazines, but they're kind of a business type of thing that they mail to you that's just for that area. That would be where you'd want to do it at. That's where you'd want to spend your $500. And I don't even know if a newspaper for Orlando would work well as well. For a smaller town, yes. The reason for that is you're not going to drive a half hour or an hour across Orlando in heavy traffic to get your hair done. You might, but I would say most people, especially guys, are not going to do that. I'm not saying that they wouldn't, but for the most part, you know, I find a place local that I like and I stay there. And if I move, I find a new place because I'm not going to drive 45 minutes to get uh, to, to get to uh, a place to cut my hair because I'm just not, you know, I'm not a big, big guy as far as haircuts are concerned or anything like that. We'll get to word of mouth in just a second, Stefan. So. I'm going to tell you another story that goes along with this. When I first came to Full Sail about four years ago, there was a uh, there was a sub shop. It wasn't a subway. It was just a local shop. It was in what we call down here a strip mall. That's where you got these all these little bitty businesses that you know are door to door to door to door in a big parking lot. Okay, so you had this place and it was called Stacked Subs. And with Stacked Subs, what you had was uh, this small place. It was along a busy highway, and it was about 
half a mile from the campus. Okay. So their market, and this is what we're going to talk about here with promotion. You want to find your market. I'll give you one of them. One of their, they had three markets that I could tell. One of their markets was full sale students. So what they did is they put flyers and posters, approved flyers and approved posters, you know, on bulletin boards around campus. One time they put a flyer on everybody's car. They got in trouble for that. But that was one market. And what they did is they offered a percentage off their subs. If you went a half a mile and got a sub from the stack sub, the other one was along the highway. Okay. And they were on what's called Semeron uh, Boulevard, which is 436 here in Orlando, right next to the school. And it's about six lanes across. So three lanes going both ways. How do you think that they got people along that road to see their, their shop? And remember, they are in a strip mall, which is back to back to back to back to back businesses. What would be a unique way? And this was very unique about four years ago, not so much today. That's exactly right, Kirk. They had a guy standing out there with a sign spinner. And in order to kind of, for you to see that that stack sub was there, he would dress up in like, best way to explain it, Miami Vice type of outfit, you know, like a Don Johnson Miami Vice and do karate out there and stuff. In other words, he was trying to get people's attention and he had a sign for people to come in. Uh, some of these, I saw a thing on the news uh, about a year ago, these sign spinners here in town, the good ones make up to 20 bucks an hour, but the good ones can like throw these things up in the air, flip them behind their back and things like that. It is a terrible job to have in Florida because I'm telling you, I would melt in July or August with these guys out there uh, spinning their signs. So that's kind of a, that's kind of a thing that's happened in the past five or six years of these sign spinners. Uh, I don't see them too many places outside of Florida, but you know, I'm sure you guys could tell me if, if you have them, you know, where, wherever you live or whatever. So really you had full sale, you had that highway and there was one other market and somebody earlier said, um, you know, local, that was the other market is you had the neighborhood around this sub place that could be considered the market as well for this sub sub shop. And I would say that probably goes two miles out. So what we, what they would have done with this, and I don't know if they did or not, cause I didn't live in, in the neighborhood, but they had, you know, the best way to reach these people would have been, you know, direct mail. So you can go out to these research companies, these marketing research companies, you can buy, say, all the households that are 18 to 35, live in a certain zip code, make a certain amount of money. You can get very specific uh, lists like this to try to reach your local neighborhood. But why do you think that they shouldn't have gone you know, and I don't know if they did or not because I didn't live in the neighborhood, but why would it have been a waste of money to put an ad for stack subs in the Orlando Sentinel newspaper? Anybody guess that? Let me say that again. Why would it have been a waste of money for them to put an ad for the stack sub and all they had was one, one restaurant in the Orlando Sentinel newspaper? And just for you to let you guys know, Orlando is made up of about a million people. There's about a million people that live in Orlando. And Kirk, you're right on, you, you know, you're getting there. The reason Orlando, you know, the reason why is Orlando is pretty big. So let me ask you, and, and George, you're, you're right. Are you going to drive a half an hour just to get a sub? No. Stefan, another reason why. You guys are seeing where we're going with this. So really, there are three markets, which was full sale a half a mile away. That highway was another market for them. And then the local neighborhood was also another market. Three different ways to promote their place. You know, three different ways to get the word out without, you know, blowing all their money on a newspaper ad. Because I'm just telling you right now, you're not going to drive a half hour to get a sub. If you've got a sub in mind, you're either going to go to Subway, which is everywhere. You know, you're going to go to Firehouse Subs. You're going to go to Quiznos. You're going to go to wherever you get your subs because of what Stefan said, the inconvenience. Okay. So that's how you need to think, especially with promotion is how can I reach my markets? So you need to think about the variables along with that and, and be able to reach. And, and trust me, this is what everybody that's ever owned a business has struggled with is how do I reach my market? Okay. So this is a very big thing, but some other promotional techniques, you guys hit these as well. Billboards is one and billboards have kind of changed in these past few years. Uh, because now you have electronic billboards. So nobody has to get up there and glue that stuff up to that billboard. Now they can change very quickly and very easily. 
a friend of mine just started uh, just started in real estate and he was thinking about doing a billboard and he found out it was only $150 to put it up there for two weeks because it's electronic. And just like your computer screen and doing a keynote presentation, that's kind of how they do these things nowadays. They have a direct feed to them, so it's not as expensive as what it used to be. The billboards, direct mail, of course, television advertising, radio advertising, Okay, you can do uh, advertising. I've, I see trucks driving around town, with, and all they are are ad trucks. They have these huge, uh, they, 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 they have a huge, for lack of a better word, big wall that they carry on the back, and they have, uh, they have billboards that drive around town during lunch hour and stuff like that to show things. But one of the most powerful ones is, I believe is what Stefan said, is word of mouth. Word of mouth is the most powerful one because it's the most believable you are most likely to believe me versus an advertising that you see on TV. Of course, you, you know me and things like that. But word of mouth also works in the opposite direction. If we have a bad experience, surveys have shown that we usually tell on average 10 people about our bad experience, whether they want to hear it or not. Okay, so, you know, l let's say I, I went out last night and, and had some Chinese like we talked about, and I had a, you know, I had a very bad reaction to it and I got food poisoning. You know, my, my students in my class probably would have heard about that. I've been like, I had stinking food poisoning. Don't ever go to that restaurant down the road, blah, 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 blah. But if I had a really, really good experience at that Chinese restaurant, am I going to come into my class and say, hey, man, I just had a great experience at that Chinese restaurant down there. You all I go to it. No. Usually what happens is something like this. Some of might say, uh, hey, I'm thinking about going out for lunch today. Anything you can recommend? I'm like, hey, that Chinese restaurant down the road, that is a great place. Do you see where this goes? So word of mouth is very, very big. And that's the reason why referrals can be a very big thing. A lot of times, you know, companies will say, if you refer us and that person becomes a customer, we'll give you a hundred dollars, you know, like car companies, you know, dealerships and things like that. So there's a lot of ways to promote your brand. Some of the newest ones, you know, are Twitter, you know, Facebook. Uh, I don't know if you know how Facebook marketing works, but uh, I work with the Orange County Small Business Administration here in town, and a friend of mine came in and said, "Hey, you know, I'm I've got I've got this photography business, and and I want to promote it." And I said, "Well, why don't you try Facebook? Because what well, what what he does is, you know, he lives at a certain zip code, and that's in his Facebook. So what he can do is he can actually buy ads, so that if you post on Facebook something about weddings or photography." or animal photography or baby photography that will come up on Facebook probably within the next minute or two. Okay. And add for that. That's how Facebook advertising works. Okay. But as you guys may know, Facebook is not as popular as what it used to be. And when I say popular, it's kind of trending down these days. And the reason for that is mothers and dads and grandmas and grandpas are getting on it. And you really don't want to know. You want them to know what you're doing. Okay. Groupon is another, is another good thing too. Uh, you know, restaurants, all kinds of things use this type of, uh, of things to reach people. Of course, you know, you've got to subscribe to it. You have to, you know, get that email in there as well. So this, these are new types of ways that people are trying to get, uh, you know, companies to come into and, and, and be able to promote their products and services and so on. So think a lot about promotion because that would be a good way, you know, for the execution of the idea. All right, that you might have for your business plan. And let's just say this before we move on to the last one, which is distribution. Um, you know, like I said before, the execution is the most important thing. You guys are probably not going to come up with anything earth shattering. Uh, what you're probably most students are going to come up with is something that already exists, a product and or service that already exists. And you just add a little, add a little something onto it, you know, a little tweak to it or whatever. And based upon that, it can, it can be a really good way of doing it. Here's maybe a, a statistic you may not know, but uh, the fastest growing restaurant in the United States right now is Five Guys Burgers. Okay. This is a burger joint. If you'd came up to me 10 years ago, I think that's when Five Guys started. If you'd came up to me five years ago and said, hey, do you want to invest in a, re a hamburger restaurant? I'd been like, are you kidding me? That's all we need is another hamburger restaurant around here. But they do have great burgers. So how do they differentiate from McDonald's and so on? Well, first of all, you can see them cooking. Uh, they are fresh ingredients. They have I true Idaho potatoes. 
uh, and and you know it's it's and when they give you fries, they just don't give you fries that fit in the thing. They they shove a ton of them in there, so you feel like you're really getting good value. Uh, whenever you go there, uh, of course, you only probably want to eat there about once every six months or so because <laughs> they are good burgers. But man, I tell you what, I think your heart hiccups every time you eat one. So uh, another another thing for restaurant wise is, you know, uh, University of Central Florida is here in Orlando and a group of students a few years ago um, started a uh, a chain that is now a chain today called Tijuana Flats. It's a Mexican restaurant. I would have said to myself, Oh, another Mexican restaurant, really? But what they do is they put a little bit of a twist on it. And and if you've ever eaten at a Tijuana Flats, it's trendy. It's 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 cool in there. They, they got different things. Think about um, and 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 a couple of places have done this, like Moe's. Okay, Moe's is another type of thing that's kind of like along the side with the Tijuana Flats. So these are the types of things that uh, that that you guys will probably come up with an idea and add a little tweak onto it. Maybe offer something that's not being offered currently in that market. You know, maybe uh, add some more value to the product and or service that you're taking a look at as well. So a lot of different ways of doing this. Okay, so the last the last part of this uh, four piece is place. In other words, called distribution. Okay, distribution can be everything from a product being made in China and they ship it over here to offering your product and or service in an area that's not currently being offered by there. Okay, like as an example, when they take a look at McDonald's, you know, there's a certain formula that they go through to uh, to come up with that to come up with that idea from McDonald's. Just a second, guys. Sorry, guys. I want to try to tell everybody to keep it down a little bit. I hope that didn't interfere. All right. So uh, you want to with, with place. You want to offer it. You want to offer it in, a, in another way of doing it. Offering it in an area that's not being offered. However, let me caution you on this. There may be good reason why that product and or service is not offered in that area. There may not be enough of a market. In other words, there may not be enough of a, of a business in that area what you're trying to provide for customers that are there. Okay. Stefan, a lot of people look at, you know, iTunes for that. Uh, and that's obviously changed over the past 10 or 12 years as well. Okay. Um, but distribution for selling records is definitely there as well. Okay. So based upon that, are there any questions over the four P's? Okay. So let's move on. Let's move on. And there's one more outer ring that we need to talk about. And this is what a lot of people do not think about when it comes to marketing and or your business. Okay. And that is a ring that you have no control over. Okay. And you'll see why here, as soon as I hit the space bar, you'll see why you don't have any control over this ring, but it's a very important part. And it's this stuff right here, economic, political, legal, and regulatory, technological, social, culture, and competitive forces. Okay. You basically, unless you are a super huge company like a Microsoft or an Apple or a Google, you are not going to have any control over these. The only thing that you might have control over if you're a very large company is political and or competitive. Political, you could use lobbyists as an example. But why we are covering this are these are all areas that you need to always keep your eye out for if you are a business owner because one change in any one of this outer ring can absolutely destroy your business or make your business go to the stratosphere okay so if we talk about economic uh you know i live here in orlando and of course there's disney right outside of town what disney tends to do is when there's a recession is when they build Okay. They build new parks and so on. Right now, they're getting ready to start an Avatar park. I really don't know why they're doing that. They just bought Star Wars franchise. They should be building a Star Wars park. But hey, who am I, right? But from an economic standpoint, uh, Disney tends to build their parks, you know, expand those parks during the recession. Not a bad way of doing it because building costs are, tend to be lower. People are looking for jobs. They take lower pay jobs, things like this. Okay. But for the most part, you know, if you're, if you're talking about high end yachts, let's say you're building yachts, yachts don't do well during a recession. I tell you what does do well during a recession. Just one, my brother works for a, um, works for a company in St. Louis and this company in St. Louis, they make wrappers 
for uh, like M&Ms and Snickers and Hershey's and things like that, they have been busy since 2008. That factory has not shut down one day since 2008 because people tend to buy, you know, these are, these are cheap, feel good types of food. And instead of going out and getting all the ingredients for a pie or buy, buying a pie from your local grocer, you know, they'll buy a Snickers bar or something like that. So these tend to do very well. Um, you know, there's some kind of economic proof types of, um, I say economic proof, <laughs> there's really none of that. But, uh, you know, if you take a look at healthcare, healthcare is very strong right now, regardless of, of a recession or what, or, or things like that, because the baby boomers, and these were people born after 1964 or before 1964, 1946 and 1964, this is a huge chunk of this country. And these people are getting older and they are demanding more health care. So that is one area that, that might kind of be economic proof for a while anyways. But the economy, anytime there's a recession, all businesses suffer. Political forces. Let me give you, uh, let, let me give you a, an idea on this. Uh, there was a, uh, there was a, this is kind of a friend of a friend type of thing. Uh, I have a friend of mine that knew a guy that went to Georgia Tech, Okay. And this happened about 15 years ago. So this guy is attending classes in Georgia Tech. His father uh, was a politician in the state of South Carolina. In February of one year, they passed a law saying that all public buildings in South Carolina had to be certified tested for lead paint. Let me state that again. They had to be certified tested for lead paint. So in other words, if your company wasn't certified to test for lead paint, you could not you cannot paint a public building, a building owned by the South, state of South Carolina. This, this law was not going to go into effect um, until the next January. So what he did is he told his son that he wanted to come back, quit Georgia Tech, come back, get certified for the state. So when this law took effect January 1st, he would be one of the few companies in the state that could do it. The law took effect January 1st. He was only one of two people, one of two companies in the state that could that could test for this lead paint for the South Carolina. When you are two companies in an entire state, you can pretty much charge whatever you want. Okay, so that would be a political forces. In other words, you know, politicians come in, they affect things, whether it's Democrats, Republicans. I lived in Wyoming for two years while Bill Clinton was in office. Uh, they did not touch hardly any area of Wyoming. But as soon as President Bush got in there, um, you know, his vice president, Dick Cheney, was from Wyoming, I mean, every, almost every square inch of that state was being drilled for oil and natural gas. So it's amazing how political forces can kind of make or break you, um, you know, when it comes to healthcare and so on and so on. Okay. Let's talk about legal and, re legal and regulatory. This is when a law changes. So let me give you a crazy story. Uh, New York City passed a law to where kids can could not take cell phones in schools anymore. Okay, and so the kids had a choice: either they left their cell phones at home, okay, or they took them to school and ran a chance of you know the schools taking them. So what a guy did, he saw this law change. He went out and bought twenty food trucks. Okay, gutted the food trucks, and this is what he did: he had these trucks sitting out somewhere outside of the school. And the kids would come up, give him a dollar. He would basically watch their cell phone all day. And I'm not just talking about one kid. I'm talking about a ton of kids. Watch their cell phones. And then at the end of the day, he gave them their cell phones back. This guy, Stefan, you remember how much each truck would make a month doing this? Do you remember? Give you a second to write that down there. Made about $10,000 a truck. Okay, not a bad way of doing it. Okay, so just because one law changed, the guy took advantage of that. And how this all, you know, these three that we just talked about up to this point, the reason why they did very, you know, some of these companies did very well is they paid attention. You know, they watched the news, they made sure they stayed in the loop. And that with you, whether it's your career or whether you're starting a business, you always got to be looking out into the future. The next one is technological forces. OK, uh, take a look at what, you know, the cell, the, the iPhone has done for the rest of, you know, a lot of different types of uh, a lot of different types of industries. <clears throat> if you take a look at the cell phone, if, specifically the iPhone, 
who buys an organizer anymore? Who buys a calendar anymore that you carry around with you? Not too many people, you know, who buys a dictation device anymore? You know, who digital cameras are on the, uh, you know, not many people are buying digital cameras anymore. Why? Because we get a camera in our pocket. All these different types of industries are affected by the technology that came out when the iPhone came out. I know there was other stuff before then, but the iPhone kind of put everything it was like a laser beam. You know, it was a great product when it came out and still going strong today. And we can talk about Androids, the same thing, although I'm more of an iPhone fan than anything. So technology can either make or break you as, as far as that can far as that concern is as well as well social culture I'll give you a really quick and easy one on this these are trends these are things that are happening in society they're trending okay as an example if we go back to when i was in high school the most popular genre back then as far as music was concerned is rock and roll today it is hip-hop you know if you're doing advertising unless you are advertising to my age group which is part of the four p's uh, you probably want to go with something that I listened to in high school that can take me back to the minute I was there. And I listen to all the music today and so, but it's not as nostalgic to me as some of the music I listened to when I was in high school. So you go from rock and roll to hip hop. You know, you you go from, you know, MTV showed music videos. MTV today is about reality TV more than anything else. So things change. Companies change. If you'd have told me back when MTV came out when I was in high school and college that they'd be showing, you know, like catfish, I would have said, you're crazy, okay? They, you know, why would they show catfish when they can show music videos all day? That's all we watched, okay? But things change. And sociocultural forces changes as, as well. Things can become hot and then not, okay? okay? So these are the types of things to always, to always look for. And then we have competitive forces. This is all about your competition and how you deal with them and what they are doing and so on. Competition is good for us, okay? I'm a big iPhone fan. I wouldn't own an Android if you gave it to me, okay? But do I want Android to be around? You better darn too not want Android to be around because the better Android gets, the better it makes the iPhone. The better the iPhone gets, the better it makes Android, okay? But if you're in that business, you're always got to pay attention to what your competition is doing. And this is a way for you guys to start up, a, you know, get a business plan and get a good business idea because you can say, you know what, I'm good in this area. I've got this idea and this is how I'm going to beat the competition. Maybe I'm going to offer this. Maybe I'm going to offer that. That is a great way of getting into the market and to sell something or to provide something as a service that nobody has provided before or, act, or add that little bit of extra value to it. Okay, so any questions about this components of strategic marketing? Because my goal with this was to kind of get you guys thinking about different types of areas and different types of things that you're trying to do. But like I said, in this class, what we're going to do is concentrate on the idea. So next week in the go to training, we're not done yet, but the next week in the go to training, we're going to talk a little bit more about your business plan, going a little bit of leadership, and then weeks three and four is all going to be leadership based. Okay, well, if there's no questions, then this is what I want to do. I want to move on and talk about your assignments, okay? The assignments that are due this week. So let's talk about the books first for this course, okay? We have two books. I know you've got the code for another book. That is your business plan book. Uh, you are not going to be using that, obviously, in this class, but you'll be doing it, um, you'll be doing it for other classes. Oh, well, Dion, I, hey, that's a great idea. Okay, don't forget about your professor with that, okay? I'm just teasing, bro. But if I if I can't, if, if that, that was really one of the goals of that is to come up with a great idea for you guys to be able to build your business. And I hope it works out good for you, Dion. All right, so back to the books here. We have two books. This is how I want you guys to think about the books. First of all, has anybody heard about these books? Most students may have heard about the 48 laws of power but some students have heard about maxwell as well all right so what you're going to do is the 48 laws of power is going to be a code that you receive in the email the maxwell book will be a book that you will receive in the mail okay so stefan i don't charge anything that wouldn't that's kind of kind of goes against me as a teacher i don't do that for my students because if you lose all your money, I don't want you to come blowing my head off. <laughs> I know you wouldn't, but you understand what I'm saying. Uh, 
and I volunteer for businesses. So that is what we are going to do here is to help you launch your business. That's the, that's what the rest of the program, part of the components is, is the business plan. So there you go. We're going to help you do that. All right. So going back to Maxwell and Green, Maxwell looks at leadership, looks at leadership from what is called servant leadership and servant leadership is a type of leadership to where you consider your team is everything. You cannot get your job done. You cannot sell your businesses or you cannot make your businesses work unless you have your team with you. To give you an idea, it's leadership in the eyes of a person like Jesus, Buddha, Muhammad, and Oprah. Okay? I am not comparing Oprah to Jesus. And if you're an atheist, just work with me, okay? I'm just giving you an idea. This is not a religion class, okay? But you look at your people as your most important asset, okay? The Maxwell book is about leader traits. The Green book, which is um, Robert Green, so you're going to hear me say Maxwell and Green. The Green book is how to play the game. Now, what I mean by playing the game is your career, I cannot teach you how to play the game because your game is going to be different from my game, different people, different companies, so on and so on. But there are some rules of the game. So from the Maxwell standpoint, we're going to look at the traits of a leader um, from integrity and things like that. The green book is how to play the game. So a lot of times, you know, these are two ends of the spectrum. This is like good versus evil. And to give you an idea of who would be a person for the green book, it would be a Donald Trump. It would be a P. Diddy. I have a P. Diddy story for you. I had a woman in class that was an artist manager in New York City. Uh, she represented a three-girl hip-hop group. So she had some connections. She met with P. Diddy, and she asked him if he'd be producer on the album. He agreed. He spent no time, no time whatsoever, not one second in the studio with this hip-hop girl group. Okay? But yet his cut of the profits were more than all three girls put together. That's the green book in a nutshell. Okay. That short story right there. In other words, you would throw your mother on a bus if you knew you could make a dime from her. And, and I'm kind of, I'm kind of over dramatizing it here, but it, it's not really that over dramatized, you know, Donald Trump and P Diddy live and eat this book every single day. I think this book has also been co-written. Um, they, they've got a new updated version that is, that has been co-authored with Robert Green and 50 Cent, okay? So it's called the Fitty Laws or 50 Laws of Power. Uh, there's actually like six more laws, but they combine it to two. So you can, 54 doesn't sound as good as 50, okay? Oh, you're absolutely right. They are ruthless, okay? We will talk about 12 of those laws, okay, in this class. The laws that I pick out from the Green Book are laws that can help you immediately. Some laws in there can help you immediately. Like law number 27 is how to create a cult-like following. That can take decades, decades to do. That's not going to help you at the first part of your career. Okay. So we're going to talk about 12 of the laws um, in the green book. We will talk about all 10 chapters in the Maxwell book. Okay. So Maxwell is more of a Jesus. Green is more of Satan. Okay. So which one are you? Well, I would say all people are somewhere in the middle. I am much, 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 much more Maxwell than I am Green. Have I had Green done to me? You better, you better believe that I've had Green done to me. Have I done Green when I've needed to? You, you better, you better straight right. I've, I've done Green to people if I've had to. Only when I've had to do it though. So, remember, Maxwell is about the traits of a leader. Green is about how to play the game as a leader. So this, these are very much of a good comparison. I promise you these are all, both of these are very good reads. I think you guys will enjoy them um, because we're not only going to look at leadership, they're going to look at you, you know, and how can you improve your leadership skills and so on. So this is, these are two excellent, excellent books. Um, and I didn't even pick them out, but they, when I first started teaching this class, I was like, wow, these are really, really, really good books. So I hope you guys enjoy these books. So like I said, 12 laws out of green, all 10 chapters out of Maxwell. There are some things that connect these two books, even though it's like Jesus and Satan type of thing. Like one of them would be reputation. I consider the most important law in the green book is to be law number five, which you guys will look at in week four. Law number five is all about your reputation. You can spend decades building a reputation and you can lose it in one second. Tiger Woods, anyone? 
Okay. Look at Tiger, what he did. He hit a tree and 15 women fell out. I mean, come on, you know, the stuff that happened to Tiger in that night on Thanksgiving about three years ago. Since then, he hasn't hardly won any golf tournaments. Um, he's, he's worth about half of what he used to be and so on. We could talk about, uh, you know, you know, people like Lance Armstrong. We could talk about, um, Joe Paterno, one, you know, just some stupid mistakes on their part has completely ruined their reputation. So, you know, there are some strings that attach these two books and that would be one example of that. Okay. So this is me probably should start off with this, but you guys got to know me a little bit through this. So I do have a doctorate uh, in marketing from Nova Southeastern. Uh, I am from Illinois. That's the reason I went to Western Illinois University. Now, what a controller is, it's a finance guy. It was over budgets, payroll, all that type of stuff for, for a university. Um, so, you know, I've got real world experience in this, in, in the leadership type of thing, which I think is always good to have for a teacher, you know. Uh, I've taught a ton of business classes over the past 19 years now. I need to update that. Um, oh, Northern. Oh, NSU. Oh, N N NSU down by Davie. So that's where I went to campus at. Um, uh, small business consultant. I already told you guys about that. AMA is American Marketing Association. Two daughters, Jenner and Paige. I'm also married to my lovely wife, Mindy, who I got married to last year. She's also another teacher here at Full Sail. And I'm a big sports fan. And if anybody's here as a Cub fan, um, we got problems. I'm just teasing. Okay. <laughs> But uh, I, I'm a huge, 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 huge St. Louis Cardinals fan, and I love the rest of those teams as well. So I try to try to stay away from the sports um, analogies, but uh, sometimes I get into that as well. So that's a little bit about me, but let's move on because this class is not about me. It's about leadership. All right, so here's some course goals um, for this class. The levels of a leader, you will find that in the chapter one of the Maxwell book. Okay, that is under the influence chapter. And what that is going to do is it's going to uh, – basically start off with level one, which is position where you start off in, you know, in a position level five, on the other hand is reserved for people that are considered what Maxwell calls personhood. And to give you an idea of who is that personhood, who is going to leave a legacy in this, in this world, whatever type of world that they, uh, that they touch. Cause remember, um, I say, remember, uh, here's what I want you guys to think about when you read chapter one of the Maxwell book, this doesn't have to be an Oprah, who is definitely as a personhood. This can be somebody in your family that has been an absolute patriarch for your family and is going to leave a legacy. So you don't have to think about leaders necessarily as these big people that we see on TV. You can be a leader within your family. You know, you can be that strong, that strong person within your family that, that does the right things and leads your family and things like that. But the fifth level that Maxwell talks about, that is personhood. And I've already mentioned one person, which is Oprah. Um, another person that we brought, that we lost recently that is a huge favorite of mine was uh, Nelson Mandela. Um, I consider to be really a personhood, the, the things that he went through and, and the uh, stands that he made. Uh, or, you know, he, his name was going to live on forever as a fighter of civil rights. You know, we can look at some of the civil rights leaders, you know, Dr. King, and even Malcolm X, even though he doesn't quite fit the Maxwell leadership traits. Um, you know, we can talk about all kinds of different people with personhood. But the thing to remember about people with personhood is that legacy. Also talk about what, understand what makes a leader stand out. This can be a rather lengthy list, but, uh, you know, different leaders stand out for different reasons. Uh, learn how to effectively problem solve. That problem solving is probably going to come mostly from people. Okay. Here's the one thing that I want you to remember about being a leader is uh, you're going to have to understand people. You're really going to have to be a psychologist at, at many times because the more you get to know people, here's the key. The more you're going to know what motivates and also what demotivates people. So the more you get to know your people, and obviously I'm talking more Maxwell and I am green right now, the more you get to know your people, the better you will be able to lead them and the more they will follow you because you will know what motivates and demotivates. And that's just one part of that problem solving. You guys will let you read the rest. Okay. Participate in leadership activities that we're going to do with discussion boards and so on. Look at number five, find ways to improve upon our attitude. Now, if I asked all, if I asked all of you in here, that, you know, have you had a bad leader or have you had a bad boss? Most, you know, if you've even had one or two bosses, most of you are probably going to say, yeah, I've had a bad boss. So have I. Uh, probably the number one thing that makes a person a bad boss is that word down there, attitude. Okay. As an example, I taught class this morning at nine o'clock. 
I had a good morning. Didn't have a bad morning whatsoever. But let's say I had one of the worst mornings of my life. Let me tell you what I what I would have done, and I have done many times. I have left that attitude at the door because why should I take that out on my students that had nothing to do with why necessarily I've had a bad morning? Why do so many bosses forget about that? You know, it's not your employee's fault that you've had a bad day or something's happened, but they take it out on on their employees. This is a common problem. Now, this is big, big time Maxwell stuff here with the attitude type of thing. Okay. But the attitude, you know, in my opinion, is one of the most important things that a leader can have because the right attitude sets the right atmosphere, which enables the right responses from the people that are around you. Okay. Yes, yeah, absolutely right on this stuff on. And then debate, discuss, and elaborate on the reading. We'll be doing that through discussion boards and everything that goes along with that. Okay, so brief course overview here. I want to make sure I emphasize this because I know you guys have already had the mastering class. Okay, so as far as your discussion posts are concerned, the first one is due before midnight on Wednesday. Now, remember if I ask you a question on the discussion post, and this is in the instructions and rubric, if I ask you a question on the discussion post, you need to at least respond with at least five sentences. Okay, you just can't say I agree with that. Okay, that's not a good enough response. So every question, and there's some discussion posts, well, I'm going to ask you three questions. You need to respond with three, at least paragraphs back. This first discussion post, there's three questions there. We make sure you respond with at least five sentences. And concerning the instructions and rubrics, consider the instructions, consider the rubrics. Is my contract to you? Is This is how I'm going to grade you. When you guys start to take a look at the assignments on FSO, as much as I can, I like to give you guys examples. I like to show you guys this is exactly what I'm looking for and so on and so on. As an example, the paper that you're going to write in week four, I actually provide you a paper that was written by a student in this class that did a very, very good job so that you get an idea of what I'm looking for in the paper. So I try to provide examples as much as possible. So that first post is due before Wednesday at midnight. The second response post is due before Sunday at midnight. Every Monday at 12.01, the assignment's open. They close on Sunday at midnight, okay? Tuesday, I'm on iChat. So tonight, I'll be on iChat from 6 to 8. But I got to tell you, really, the best way to get in touch with me is through email. I answer email at 2 o'clock in the morning sometimes. I'm not saying I do that every morning, but, you know, uh, but the iChat is there if you want to chat, okay? And that will be there for uh, every week as well. But emails is what I really like. And then, of course, if you have any technical issues, and we had a big one last month, by the way, with uh, Keynote that I'm still working through. Um, so that, but that's my problem, not you guys. FSO is there. Um, that's the, that's the toll-free number to call them if you've got a technical issue that you're trying to uh, figure out how to do. Okay. So if your computer is not starting up, don't email me, don't call me. You need to call FSO support. Okay. So, let me back up one. Okay, so the discussion board we've already talked about. The next thing is your blog creation. So let's take a few minutes here and talk about the blog. Okay, now I know you got your mastery journal that you started in, 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 or you have your, yeah, your mastery journal that you started last month. What you're going to create this month and continue throughout the rest of the program is you guys are going to create a blog. Now here's what you need to think about with the blog. The blog needs to be an area that you want to go into after graduation. Let me repeat that. This blog needs to be something, an area that you want to go into when you graduate. So what do I mean by that? Well, I'm going to give you a couple stories around with students that have been very successful with the blog, okay, and what it did for them. I had a student a couple years ago that wanted to work for Ryan Seacrest. So what he did was um, he developed his blog around television production. Okay. And so the blog posts that he did was all about television production. The theme of his blog was television production and so on and so on. But he, but he did this with, you know, Ryan Seacrest in mind. So somebody here at the school knows somebody that knows Ryan Seacrest, kind of like one of those six degrees of separation type of things. So he talked to them. They he got them to give the resume to Ryan Seacrest and what got him the job with Ryan Seacrest was the blog because what he did with this blog, and this is the whole purpose of this blog is to get you guys to whatever you want to go into, you know, maybe film or music, you know, or artist management or all that type of stuff 
is to show companies and people out there that you're up to date looking at these latest trends, looking at these new ideas, thinking about this type of thing. Like uh, a few months ago, there was a great thing. You guys remember all the, the, the Tupac um, you know, hologram from a few months ago. That was a very big thing for the entertainment industry. And let me tell you why. Besides what you may already know, um, you know, this has not really been done before and blah, blah, blah. Well, all of a sudden, a lot of artists realized that somebody could do a hologram of them. It's not them. They're not on film, which is copyrighted. This is a hologram. So a lot of entertainers all of a sudden said, wow, we need to put something in my in my claws that if somebody does a hologram, I'm still going to get paid for it let alone the technology that goes into it. Now, how they got this to do, uh, how they got to do this for Tupac is they actually asked his mother if they could show his likeness on that festival out to uh, California to do that, doing that with Michael Jackson as well. There are some artists that are starting to do that because of this hologram type of technology. You know, you could talk about, you know, if you're, if you're into um, sound, you could talk about the latest equipment. You could talk, you could do reviews, you could, uh, things like that. But whatever the case may be, you know, go out there and, and do searches for things within your, within your area. And then you can write blog posts about that. Okay. Another one, <clears throat> Dion, I tell you what, hit me with an email on that and, and kind of give me your blog address and I'll let you know that. Okay. I'll let you know if you can use that or not. Um, but a, a, another one that, that did uh, a blog, we had a, a girl go through here. She wanted to be an artist manager. And so she specifically was looking at the hip hop genre. So she did her she did her blog on up and coming hip hop artists. And what she would do is she'd go to downtown Orlando, you know, go to the clubs, which if you're artist manager, you need to be doing anyways. She went down the club. She would interview people for the blog, blog posts. She would interview groups, DJs, all that type of stuff. And then a music festival, hip hop festival in Miami saw her blog, asked her to come down. They flew her down all expense paid for an entire weekend while the festival was going on. They gave her complete backstage access. And the only thing in return that they wanted was for her to talk about the festival and talk about the, the groups that were at the festival and so on. Today, she's now working for a record label. Okay. And then the last one, and best way to explain this, and this is his words, not mine. There was a guy that came through the program about 40 years old. He had worked uh, mostly for like uh, the Miss World, Miss USA pageants. He was you know, into show, show production and things like that. He wanted to be the Martha Stewart of men. In other words, you know, this was a very sophisticated guy, like a metrosexual type of guy. And so what he did is when he was out to LA, he hired a film crew to come in and do some segments. Okay. Like as an example, I saw a segment that he did on a dinner party, you know, the candles and the lighting and the wine and all this type of thing for us, like me, that doesn't know any better and say, Hey, I'll take a Bud Light and that'll work just fine for me. I'm not that type of guy, but this is what he was doing. Okay. So what he did is he pitched this idea at that time, Oprah was starting up her network. She pitched this idea to Oprah. They loved the idea, but they didn't want him. And so he said, well, if I'm not going along with this, then you can't have my show. So what he did with the blog is he continued this idea. So his blog post, which he ended up start doing every single day, when he was done with the program, about a year after he's done with the program, these blog posts then became a book. Okay. And he's still looking for that big break for his show. All right. So... You know, these are the types of successes that we've had with blogs. Another thing that you want to do is you want to make sure that you don't use the wrong name for your blog. So let me tell you a little story that goes along with this. We had a lab assistant here at the school. He was a Foley guy, Foley sounds. If you know what a Foley guy is, they take recordings of sounds, of animals, different types of things, everything that can make a sound. And they put these types of things in movies and TV shows and records and all kinds of stuff. So anyways, his blog started to really take off. So he decided to sell some Foley sound. So he went out in the garage, he did some recordings of some power tools, and he started selling these on his blog. About four months later, he got a cease and desist letter from a company of the same name in Tennessee that sold sounds as well. So not only did he get a cease and desist letter, he had to pay them royalties for the use of their name. So try to come up with a unique name that kind of describes your blog. You don't, like as an example, I don't want to use Steve Atkins at blogspot.com because who's Steve Atkins? Why should I care? And it doesn't explain anything. My blog name is leadership by proxy. So let me kind of show you what my blog is like here. Okay.
Okay, so this is my this is my blog right here. So just the name alone, you know it's got something to do with leadership. The reason I chose this right here with this lonely tree is when you are a leader sometimes, it is very, very lonely. And there's a lot of reasons for that. And hopefully you'll pick that up on the, uh, on you know, when you guys are going through the books. But what I did here, like as an example, these are posts like you guys will have to do. What I mean by posts is this is the type of stuff you'll have to do right here. So I was reading the Orlando Sentinel one day and I saw this opinion piece about children working for their parents. Law number two, which is part of the readings this week, never put too much trust in friends, learn how to use enemies. And I said, friends can be substituted for family. Okay. So I read this, I read this article and I put my spin on it. Okay. This is perfectly, perfectly acceptable. Let's say you're in music production and some new soundboard comes out and you read a review on it. Talk about that review. Talk about the good, the bad, the pros, the cons, read other reviews on it and do your own blog post on it. You know, I come down here and I talk about reputation and I talk about Jerry Sandusky and, and the Joe Paterno thing. Okay. Importance of staff. Okay. Negative political leadership ads, all this type of stuff. I see things and what it does is it gets me to thinking about, you know, leadership and then I just write my opinion on it. So this is the type of thing that you can do if you want to go along those lines. Um, but, but the most important thing is to have a theme and do your blog posts along those themes and, uh, you know, come up with a name that kind of explains what your blog is about. So, Dan, let's see. Uh, the law right there. Let me start. <laughs> Help in business is one thing, but I would very much caution to go into business with family. If you don't believe me, uh, take a look at Orange County Choppers or the reality TV show Sweetie Pies, things like that. Uh, read the law and then get back to me and tell me what you think. I'm just going to say this and guys and gals, this is just my opinion. Before you go into business with your friend or your family member, understand this. It can be the best or it can be one of the absolute worst, um, you know, decisions you make. Okay. And so just read the law, tell me what you think and see what you go from there. So I'm not trying and I'm not trying to tell you no, but just be careful with that. Okay. <laughs> All right. So that is it talking about the, the assignments today. Um, there's always going to be an archive of this session that I will post. If you guys can't make it live next week or the, you know, the next three weeks, it's going to always be posted on FSO and there is a quiz. The quiz covers the lecture part of it. As long as you listen to the lecture, you should be able to do just fine on the quiz because it's just basically making sure you attended and you listened to it. So the archive is going to be put up. Those of you, those eight that stayed the whole tire, you don't have to worry about the archive, but I will be posting the, the quiz every week on FSO. Stefan, they're always at the same time every week and it's always the same link. So that email I sent to you guys, that link will remain the same for the next three weeks and that will never change. So always three, always two o'clock on Tuesdays, two o'clock Eastern time, and it's always the same link. So that's how you guys can contact me. Um, my email address is really easy to remember. It's Sadkins, S-A-D-K-I-N-S at FullSail.com. So Dion, I'm going to get ready to post a quiz as soon as we get off here. So it's Sadkins at FullSail.com. My wife's name is Mindy. So her name, email address is Madkins. So we're Madkins and Sadkins. Okay. When she gets mad, I get sad. So anyways, um, if there's any other questions, this is how I always end it. If you guys have no other questions, uh, you know, just log off. And when everybody's logged off, I will know that it's time for me to go ahead and end this. I'll tell you what, I'm going to turn off the recording.